At the beginning of the Common Era, to the east of the Roman Empire, a city rose from the desert. A city which for 2,000 years has held a mysterious attraction. Its name conjures up both a glorious past and a tragic destiny. Palmyra sat at the crossroads of great trading routes with caravans from Mesopotamia, from India and China. Surrounding the town, vast necropolises housed the world of the dead, peopled with sculpted faces. Undeciphered vestiges which were yet to be understood. One archaeologist decided to persevere in studying these stones to piece together a lost Aramaic population. Locating Palmyrene funerary portraits is sort of a little bit of a detective quest. The portraits will let us unravel how Palmyrene saw themselves and how they saw themselves in relation to the rest of the world. Rubina Raja hopes to unveil a more human story of this lost civilization. To do so, she must track down hundreds of funerary portraits scattered all over the world. Her search will bring together an exceptional collection and reveal the identity of these great Palmarine families, their history and their genealogy. Buried for 2,000 years, the faces of Palmyra have re-emerged in plain sight, proof that the great city lives on through the traces left by its past inhabitants. Rubina Raja is Danish, she first came across the funerary portraits of Palmyra by chance on a visit to the Nie Carlsberg Glyptotech Reserve Collection in Copenhagen. In 2011, when the archaeologist came across these portraits carved in stone, she realized that no one had ever taken the time to study them in detail. It was a revelation. I knew that they had the world's largest collection of Palmarine funerary portraits, but I didn't know how that would look because they had never all been in the exhibition. So when they opened the doors to the study collection, which is close to the public, it was like walking into a funerary chamber. You get very close physically to the material, you can touch it. In Palmyra, the world of the dead was everywhere. It surrounded the world of the living. Several necropolises circled the town, the most famous being the Valley of the Tombs. It is distinguished by its towers of varying height and its huge burial chambers, hypogea and small temples. Inside the tombs are hundreds of faces, portraits, but also scenes from daily life, family histories. They bear witness to a golden age in Palmyra, from the first to the third century AD. It was through my study of these that I realized that we actually have to do with the largest corpus, so the largest group of visual representations of deceased people from the ancient world. I really realized that this would be a fantastic contribution to scholarship if I could collect all these portraits and make them available to, to scholars and interested um, academics. Rubina Raja's investigation offers a new approach, but she is up against several obstacles. To start her research, she would like to go to Syria, 
The archaeological landscape offers a wealth of information, and hundreds of portraits are still buried in tombs which have not been excavated. But the war has changed everything. In 2015, Palmyra was bombed by the Islamic State several times with the aim of destroying these remains. A few ruins still stand, but the majority of this heritage site has been lost forever. Rabina Raja's work brings unexpected life back to this great but wounded city. With the conflict in Syria, we of course had a, a massive challenge in the project because one idea had been to go to Syria and actually document the objects in Palmyra. That was not possible. So we had to come up with a different strategy. As she couldn't go there herself, Rabina decided to follow in the footsteps of a pioneer, a man who has inspired her throughout her research, Harold Ingold, a Danish archeologist who led a dig in Palmyra between 1924 and 1925. He brought back several objects which constitute the main part of the Nie Carlsberg Glyptotech collection. These would form the basis of Rabina Raja's work. Starting with this small number of fragments, she has gone on to compile the biggest family album ever made in archaeological research. This marks the beginning of a long period of research to find portraits scattered around the world, outside of Syria. To carry out the research, she gathered a team of young researchers. They work at Aarhus University in Denmark and begin their research in the reserve collections of the Glyptotech. We photograph things and then we talk about them and we describe them in very many details. So that's a very tedious process. It takes a long time to make sure that you describe everything in a portrait correctly. So that is one very basic and time-consuming part of the project. And the other part is to sort of contextualize what we can. What do this young woman's braids reveal? Which family did this man come from? Which tomb was he buried in? What does this crown tell us, or this expression? Every face holds clues, details, however tiny, which help advance the research. The fact these portraits were carved with such precision means they belonged to important families. Ordinary folk were not depicted, but rather buried directly in the sand or rock. In the Valley of the Tombs, the architecture of the towers and the burial chambers often denoted power and rivalry. From the 1st to the mid-2nd century AD, the richest families commissioned funerary towers several stories high. Built above an underground tomb and positioned at the highest point of the hill to be seen by all. The middle classes built hypogea, burial chambers carved into the rock, the more the walls were covered with sculptures and paintings, the more respectable the family and the longer it would stand the test of time. Some chambers contained up to 400 portraits carved over the generations. Towards the end of the second century, temple tombs or temple houses were constructed, marrying Oriental with Greco-Roman architectural traditions. Once they were built, these family tombs were treated as real estate. They are a unique palmarine phenomenon that actually was built over more than a hundred years and goes together with the monumentalization of the cityscape. So they sort of surround sides of the city and makes the city a very physical, tangible place, almost protected by the dead society. Palmyra is so well situated in the desert that it soon became coveted. It sits at the crossroads of the main trade routes from Syria, Mesopotamia, 
India and China. What made Palmyra's fortune even before the Roman era was its geographical position, because Palmyra is situated halfway between the Mediterranean and the Euphrates, the river that gives access to the Persian Gulf and to products coming from beyond the Persian Gulf, from the Far East, from Africa, from Arabia Felix, and so on. Palmyra's wealth increased considerably when the town became part of the Roman Empire, around the year 17 AD. It opened itself up to the huge Roman market and to the possibility of trading merchandise imported from the Persian Gulf throughout this very vast empire. The caravans made the city's fortune. The Roman Empire opened the doors to a huge marketplace. But the crown jewel which facilitated Palmyra's great destiny was the water which bubbled up through the sand. In this inhospitable desert, the water made Palmyra highly attractive and essential. In reality, the desert is anything but empty. The desert is owned. It belongs to large nomadic groups. So you had to negotiate rights of passage with them. You had to negotiate access to water with them. You can't cross the desert without having access to wells. And this is precisely what made the fortune and wealth of the people of Palmyra. It was the capacity to provide means of transport, to maintain the best possible relations with the surrounding tribes, and also to have the military force to fight off the bandits or thieves or anyone who wanted to attack the caravans. The caravan traders carried arms and knew all the dangers along the trade routes. They were the lifeblood of Palmyra, and contributed to making the powerful families in the city rich. They were entrusted with the most precious merchandise. Becoming part of the Roman Empire was a great opportunity for Palmyra. The merchants grew wealthy and did everything they could to make their city shine. Elite groups of Palmyrenes were formed. Influences of Greco-Roman culture appeared in fashion and architecture. The structure of the necropolises was also influenced by Roman funerary rites and by the splendour of the decoration of their tombs. It was Rome, more than all regions in the empire, that developed the idea of portraiture. The idea itself may have been Greek, but the manner of representing the person in a bust is essentially Roman. There's a kind of affectation in the way the fingers are placed on the face. A wish to present oneself to the viewer. So the gesture in itself is one of modesty. All this is Roman influence, but combined with an oriental tradition in the rich portrayal of the jewellery. In their desire to bequeath all these portraits to posterity, were the Palmarines looking to leave their mark on history at the height of their golden age? How do we see them 2,000 years later? Palmyrid portraits are very recognizable. At first, they almost all look the same. They're looking straight ahead, they have big eyes, they have their drapery, their hair. But the more time you spend with them, the more you see they're not the same. They have asymmetries, they're turning differently. The inscriptions speak poignantly with the names of the deceased. In the tombs, they're speaking about their families, their relations with one another, and they're expressing their, their human values. And it's very powerful. Mm -hmm. 
When a Palmarine family decided to build a tomb, it called on sculptors. They carved the portraits on the stone slabs which were used to close the entrance to the Lokuli, deep niches which housed the bodies of the dead. Each individual represented had to be named and linked to a family. Sometimes there is nothing more than a fragment of stela, a piece of sandstone, which the team must match with a fragment identified on another site. To begin with, the team of archaeologists tries to piece together the genealogy of one of the great dynasties of Palmyra, the Ella Bell family. Every morsel retrieved is compared with existing scientific records. Once a match has been found, this vast gallery of portraits becomes a language holding an abundance of clues. Very many of the funerary portraits are combined with inscriptions. So it's basically the link between the portrait and the inscription that brings the individual to life. But there are also some examples that do not carry inscriptions. We don't know whether on the one hand these inscriptions could also have just been painted on the portrait next to the portrait so they might have been lost over time or whether sometimes when the portraits were very nicely contextualized in the family grave that they didn't need an inscription. On several portraits we can make out writing in different languages, including Aramaic, a dead language related to Arabic and Hebrew. Rubina Raja does not know how to decipher Aramaic, and there are only a few experts able to read this language. Jean-Baptiste Yon is a researcher in Greek, Aramaic and Latin epigraphy. Rubina manages to persuade him to join her team. His contribution proves essential to the research. This is my new office, very well searched. So this is the Abbot Barthélemy uh, plates, the one he used to um, translate and decipher the Palmyrian script. And this is, uh, his, uh, to translate these mysterious lines, Jean-Baptiste Yon relies on the work of Abbot Barthélemy, who decoded the language in the 18th century. When you look at the Palmyrian inscription which has been discovered, you work in a similar way to Abbot Barthélemy, looking for names and family relationships, with words which are immediately apparent, like this one here, Bach, meaning son, and then you have a name, a first name, Zabdibol here, which is followed by Bach, son of, the inscription is lost here. We have the name Bach again, the word Bach, son of. So there we have the person, the name of the father which has disappeared, and here, the name of the grandfather. This long process of deciphering and comparing texts allows Jean-Baptiste Yon to establish family trees. They can be used to identify the owners of the tombs and to help trace the origin of the portraits, even though some of them will be impossible to place. Take, for example, this individual who's called Bagadana. We can see the Aramaic, so Bagadana, the name in Aramaic, and then in Greek he's called Apollodorus. When you look at the genealogy, you see that this individual came from a great family, the Elabel family, whose tower we know. And on this family tree, this individual comes here and is called Bagadana, son of Elabel, son of Maliku. Built in the year 103 by four brothers, the Ella Bell Tower is one of the most famous in the Valley of the Tombs and one of the most studied. For archaeologists, it serves as a reference. Over its four floors, several epitaphs established a connection between family members. The reliefs and the ceilings were finely carved and painted. The exterior of the funerary tower was designed to assert the family's social status at the heart of the town's elite. The interior of the tombs was a reserved space, an intimate place where several generations were united for eternity. 
The Palmarines lived in two parallel worlds. Publicly, they wanted to appear Roman, but as families, it was their traditional culture that was asserted in the details. One can call Palmyra a nodal point or a point of intersection. It would be wrong to call it a melting pot of cultures, for example. So it was a point where a lot of different knowledge about different cultures came together and was reinterpreted within the local Palmarine context. The ability to accept and assimilate several cultures was essential for the inhabitants of the town. Their city was enriched by all the different influences from Mesopotamia and from the Arab and Greco-Roman culture. It was as if the whole world converged here. You have to imagine a town teeming with activity, large avenues with colonnades where people could move around and take shelter from the sun or the rain, opening onto different shops where you could find goods from everywhere, where you came to get supplies, so it was pretty animated. When Palmyra became part of the Roman Empire, the inhabitants wanted to show their sense of belonging by building a new town with grandiose buildings, and they even renovated the old buildings, embellishing them and making them bigger. An important trading post with many cultures and great prosperity. At the beginning of the first millennium, the city experiences a great many changes. To the north of the oasis, a new town rose from the sand, traversed from east to west by a large avenue, with a long colonnade on either side. Several baths, a theatre and a marketplace are built. Daily life was organised around this hub. The god Bol was the protector of the city called Bell by the Palmarines because of the influence of neighbouring Mesopotamia. He is often represented alongside other deities, the most well-known being Balshamin, Yaribol, Malak Bell and Aglibol, the moon god. Despite the ever-increasing Greco-Roman influence of the first three centuries, the city remained steeped in multiple faiths. The Temple of Bell, for example, was almost totally demolished to be rebuilt in the contemporary style, with a Greco-Roman exterior, but conserving the features for worshipping the temple's gods. Wealth was reflected in the sumptuousness of the city, a sumptuousness expressed by the Palmarines themselves. I want to contradict the myth that it was the Romans who built Palmyra. They didn't. Perhaps the Romans gave them inspiration. And you see it in the Palmarines' appearance, the way they represent themselves, how they highlight themselves, how they stage themselves, most notably in their tombs and their funerary monuments. Mirroring society, the tombs reflect the eclectic taste of the Palmarines. As in the world of the living, they reveal a diversity in social conditions. A city world where every column, every little temple or tomb bears witness to the subtle intricacy of the blending of Syro-Mesopotamian and Greco-Roman beauty. Harold Ingold was among the first to understand this diversity of knowledge when he entered the tombs of Palmyra in 1924. He brought back numerous notebooks, conserved in Copenhagen in the Glyptotech Museum reserves. Anne-Marie Nielsen is curator of antiquities. She is preparing to show them to Rabina Raja. He was uh, working the way good researchers and scientists should. I think it's, uh, his work is impressive because he was so systematic and at a time before computers he was creating a very, very logical system and he was very, very, very 
keen to note everything. So his work is something you can only admire. At the time, the Danish archaeologist took pains to catalogue the position of each portrait in relation to its original tomb. For Rubina Raja, these boxes contain more than one answer to the question she has been pondering. During the research, new details have emerged. Researchers and collectors have contacted Rubina to tell her about the existence of portraits she hasn't yet identified. It is time for her to go and see them. To this end, Rome is highly symbolic. The history of the Italian city is closely linked with that of Palmyra. For Rubina Raja, a trip to Rome is of the greatest significance. Right at the center of the ancient Roman Empire, which ruled over much of the world, she unearths several Palmarine portraits, proof that this funerary art was in no way a minor genre. On the contrary, it is so remarkable from an archaeological viewpoint that many have been bought by the Vatican, including one very rare piece. These two reliefs are particularly interesting, especially the relief of the woman, which is rare. There are only a few of them among those that have been found. It betrays a woman, probably of marriageable age, who perhaps died young, who is not wearing a veil on her head as most Palmarine women did. Her hair is simply tied up in a cone. This style of the time resembles that of the Empress Faustina and allows us to date the relief to the 2nd century AD. Her jewels, her bracelets, her necklaces and her earrings are also of that time. Another very interesting detail. This blank tablet would have been painted and held an inscription, but the pigment has been lost. This portrait is undoubtedly one of the most precious in this collection. Yes, and the hairdo is very special. I mean, there are only 20-something pieces of this in, in the whole corpus of the, of the portraits. A woman without a veil, with a determined look and holding a tablet. Could she be a student, a scholar? There are not enough clues to say. But the portrait demonstrates that each little detail can shed new light on the life of the men and women of Palmyra. The portraits from Palmyra were in classical archaeological scholarship always considered what we term provincial, so from outside of Rome. We would say the same of things from outside of Greece if we are talking about the Hellenistic or the classical period. But that is a very Eurocentric way of viewing portraiture. So viewing it from Rome means that we only see what the Romans gave to the rest of the world, but not what the rest of the world, in fact, also gave back. And what I'm very interested in is, of course, the interaction between these vast regions, which were in contact for centuries and even millennia. And what I want to explore is really the relationship and the trajectories and, and the exchange that also went on. Ever since she made her first discoveries, Rubina Raja has regarded these portraits as an original art form, which was not erased under Roman influence. While she is in the Italian capital, Rubina gets news that the customs authorities have intercepted a portrait which comes from Palmyra. Intrigued, she asks permission to see it. Uh, 
The customs unit specializing in the trafficking of artworks agrees to allow her access to a place which is kept under close surveillance. A man with two young children beside him. Did they die together? Or did the father want to be accompanied by his descendants, represented symbolically when he entered eternity? For Rubina Raja, it's a typically Palmyrene representation because the Romans hardly ever depicted their deceased children. It's very clear that in Palmyrene art, children did play a role, both as attributes to their parents, so showing that a woman had children, or showing that a man was a father, but often the children are also shown in their own right, so symbols of parents mourning their dead children. So that again brings up the question, which sort of children gets to be represented? And are some of these children, even though they have names and are individuals, are they also representative of a larger group of children? Because we can assume that many more children died than actually are represented in the funerary art. But they were for commemoration. From the first century AD, Portrait sculpture followed trends, as in the rest of the Roman Empire. Between the years 50 and 150, men are often depicted beardless, with short hair falling lightly forwards. Later, they have beards or moustaches. Their hair is longer and curly. They wear a pleated tunic with a cloak draped over one shoulder, in the Roman style. As for the women, their rank is reflected in their jewellery. These jewels reveal the incredible luxury of the goods passing through Palmyra. Fine pearl necklaces from the Persian Gulf, precious stones from India or Africa. We see fancy drapery and we see jewellery. We've lost the colour. These were all painted. We have traces of it, painted and gilded, but we see headbands and turbans and veils and necklaces and earrings and bracelets and pendants and these reflected the actual wealth of the city what they brought along the caravan routes things of light weight but high value silks spices and gems and when we look at the necklaces and rings and pendants we have to imagine them brightly colored representing the wealth of the palmyrans that allowed the constructions of these tombs, the carvings of the portraits, and of course, the great monumental architecture for which the city was renowned. The increasing wealth of important families determined the architecture and the social structure of the city. In matters of trade, Palmyra enjoyed a certain degree of autonomy, although Rome kept a grip on the taxes and the fiscal status of the great trading posts. The cities of the empire pay taxes to Rome, a levy per capita and land tax. This situation of paying taxes continued up until 212, the date when the Roman emperor Caracalla decided to grant all free inhabitants of the empire Roman citizenship. This meant that from that moment on, all Palmarines became Roman citizens. Their status as a Roman colony gave them a higher legal status than other cities which didn't have it. And one advantage of that, among others, was that the city was exempt from paying tributes. In other words, the inhabitants no longer had to pay Rome. They had to pay other taxes, but not the tribute, which is a kind of submission. Tributes on land and per capita. So the Palmarines become Roman citizens. In funerary art, the evolution can be seen particularly in the depiction of women. 
Adorned in rich fabrics, covered with jewels, they are carved with ever greater finesse. Often wearing traditional accessories, they seem very attached to their eastern roots. In the early period, the first century CE, women are often shown with a spindle and distaff which would be used for textile making and which are objects that we see as connected to the domestic, private sphere at home in the house, taking care of a household and so on and so forth. These are tasks of which every woman who was head of a household would be in charge. So, to a certain extent, there is a value placed on the depiction of women. We have seen this in ancient Greece, and whilst it was sometimes rather overlooked, in Palmyra it still gives equal importance to the role of women. Women are in charge of the household. Sometimes they're shown holding a key. The funerary portraits of women are highly detailed. They bear witness to a history of Palmyra where women made their mark. Although men ran the political and administrative life of the city, it was in fact a woman who tried to take over when the city was at the height of its power. Her name was Zenobia, and she helped to make Palmyra famous by defying the supreme authority, Rome. There was a period of crisis of power in Rome. Emperors were following on in quick succession. In 270, the Emperor Claudius died of the plague, after which Aurelian was proclaimed Emperor by the legions of the Danube. At that time, Zenobia was widowed, and she had, to a certain extent, taken over from her husband, inasmuch as she was the regent of her son, who was too young to rule. We can see in coinage, it's clear that she tried to negotiate with Aurelian a share of imperial power in Rome. Evidently, Aurelian was not in agreement. And that's when she proclaimed her son emperor. She understood that there would be no power sharing, and she gave herself the title of empress as mother of the emperor. And that, of course, led to what became the uprise of Palmyra against the Romans. So, Zenobia managed to take large parts of the Middle East and Egypt and parts of Anatolia. So the Romans were cut off from the East, from the trade, from political power. And that was what basically led to the Romans sacking Palmyra in the late third century. The Emperor Aurelian put an end to Zenobia's imperial ambitions by waging a bloody war against Palmyra. The city began to fall into decline. But Zenobia goes down in history as the heroine who dared pit herself against the most powerful empire in the world. Apart from her profile on a Palmyrene coin, no portrait sculpture of the self-proclaimed Empress has been identified to this day but she remains a legendary character. Despite her research, Rabina Raja has never found any trace of her in inscriptions on stones. Zenobia has lived on in stories. Taken prisoner in Rome, there is no historical clue as to where she is buried. Queen Zenobia is uh, really still an enigma. Um, it is basically the person Palmyra is most famously known for, but also the individual who we really know very little about because it's not Palmyra who speaks about Zenobia, it is sources from the outside who speaks about Zenobia. And they only speak about her after the fall of Palmyra. So we on the one hand have the Roman sources, and on the other hand have a few Eastern sources telling us about who she perhaps was. There are too many unknowns to allow us to piece together the story of this great Palmyrene family up to the fall of Zenobia and Palmyra at the very end of the third century. 
Over time, one of the most beautiful ancient cities in the Middle East has been stripped of a large part of its heritage. Today, the funerary portraits are scattered, making work for the archaeologist and her team increasingly difficult. Jean-Baptiste Dion has come from Paris especially to decipher some new documents. Wife, and we know her name and her genealogy, so we know. And she was called Badia, which is quite a rare name. And she was placed there. I think her locus was next to the her husband in the, in this part. So, which makes clear that this part, at least, of the tomb, belongs to the family. But we have to place the other, and I will need your help to give me the position of this man. It's difficult to make the links with other people in the family, but uh, it's interesting. And, uh. From its base in Copenhagen, Rubina's team has to rely on the collaboration of university colleagues and researchers to open new avenues. During the research process, it becomes apparent that the portraits sculpted in the third century are the most refined, but they are also the last. With the decline of their city, the Palmarines no longer carved busts of their dead. Among the final portraits is one well known to archaeologists, one of the best conserved, one of the most admired. The portrait of a woman, once more. Called the Beauty of Palmyra, one of the masterpieces of the Nee Carlsberg Glyptotech. Well, the Beauty of Palmyra has a, an interesting story in the way that it was a portrait that was excavated in one of Harl Ingholt's excavations in 1928. So we know actually which graves she comes from, and we know that this was a very um, high-level elite grave, namely one of the either temple tombs or uh, house tombs uh, right outside of the city center in Palmyra. And it's a very particular uh, piece because it's so elaborate. So she wears seven different sorts of necklaces, for example. She has a very elaborate headdress. Another particular thing with this particular sculpture is that we also have some of the polychromy, so the colors still remain on the sculpture. The beauty of Palmyra is one of the last busts from the golden age of the city. With all the adornments denoting great lineage, it shows to what extent the Palmarines cultivated their multiple identities. So we can, for example, see that her jewelry comes from different parts of the world, not only of the Roman Empire. And we can even see that the portrait style that's used for her facial traits might actually draw on more Eastern traditions, for example, Gandharan art, which was well known in that period. So the portrait doesn't only reflect Roman portrait culture influence, but deliberately pulls together different portrait styles in one portrait, and in that way makes it a very local portrait. From the beauty of Palmyra to Zenobia, women brought great depth to the history of Palmyra. Beautiful, mysterious, they perpetuated a legend which has survived for centuries and which outlives the great city in the desert. After it was conquered, Palmyra quickly lost its splendor. Other trade routes opened at the crossroads of the east and west. History could have stopped here and the city been consigned to oblivion. In the centuries which followed, several warlords occupied the city. In 745, Marwan II, the last Umayyad caliph, tore down the ramparts. In turn, it was sacked by Temerian in the 15th century. After the Golden Age came the Age of Ruins. I think the idea of Palmyra is very romantic. There in the desert, half buried by the sands, seemingly but not actually forgotten, rediscovered by Europeans, but of course known to the local people all along. But this place 
separate from time that has survived time, I think is a very romantic notion for us. No matter what time of day, the ruins had a pinkish hue, which changed with a luminous intensity. The sun played with the color. It was always beautiful. Despite being destroyed on many occasions, the city never died. It became the pearl of the desert, an arid land whose inhabitants transformed it into a wealthy oasis. The legend was born. Everyone wanted a slice of Palmyra to share in the sophistication described by writers and artists. So the remains of the city became widely dispersed. A scattered community which complicates the archaeologist's task in the 21st century. After several months of collecting, comparing and painstaking decrypting, Rabina Raja's team have compiled an inventory of nearly 3,700 pieces. Over the past eight years, from Palmyra to Tokyo, from Rome to Los Angeles, Rabina has unearthed these portraits from all four corners of the earth, relentlessly. Now she is coming to the end of her search, as she succeeded in reuniting the most beautiful pieces of this vast, dispersed family, which has become like her own. One can say that I had been aware of them, but I had never really realized the potential that they held and the potential that we could unleash if we collected all of them. So I knew them, but I wasn't intimate with them like I am now or like I became from 2011. This intimacy is the fruit of the archaeologists' determination, working tirelessly to grant these portraits their rightful place in great museums. After a first exhibition at the Getty Foundation in Los Angeles in spring 2019, Rabina Raja opens the biggest display of the funerary portraits of Palmyra ever organized at the Nie Carlsberg Glyptotech in Copenhagen, the same place where she came across these enigmatic sculptures for the first time. No archaeological research had ever shown Palmyra in this light, a human community whose rights family relationships and aesthetic values were revealed in all their strength beyond death, as if they were transcending it. While the monumental ruins give clues to prosperity under the Roman Empire, the funerary portraits tell a very different story. They invite us to share in an intimacy, a time and space which outlive the decline of the city and its great families. The project is a major addition to what we know about Palmyra. It might not keep the legend about the city alive, but it certainly keeps the history of the city very much alive. Far removed from the conflicts which are tearing the Middle East apart, this exhibition restores Palmyra to the glory of ancient times. It rekindles the memory of a city which some have tried to consign to oblivion. I just couldn't believe it. Even today, I still wonder if it was only a bad dream. It's sad and it's just so astounding that anyone could destroy monuments like that. On an archaeological level, the loss was irredeemable. It could never be rebuilt as it was. It could never be replicated exactly. The destruction wreaked by ISIS can, I think, be explained by the international status Palmyra held. Palmyra was part of our global heritage. The destruction of these um, monuments, whether they are from the Roman period or Islamic period, is, is one way of, of destroying the cultural heritage of an entire people. 
And that was unforeseeable that it would be so intense as it was. They were doing it to hurt us in the West, to hurt us with cosmopolitan values. The ancient city had very cosmopolitan values. And I'm not sure that Palmyra was so offensive to ISIS or not, but they saw a vehicle to hurt us. And that saddened me. I thought it, it was incredibly terrible. Palmyra as a city has been ruined before. And I'm sure Palmyra will survive somehow. But the, um, the catastrophe to the people of Syria is unbearable. <laughs> This is the reality of Palmyra today. But its legend has proved stronger and lives on. When they constructed their necropolises and commissioned the best sculptors to carve their portrait busts for almost three centuries, did the Palmyrenes know what they were doing? What legacy they were hoping to leave? When we see such nobility in a world carved in stone, it seems they have bequeathed not just a family history, but one of a whole community, an eternal testimony to their time in the desert. Undoubtedly, they hoped that once carved in stone, neither wars nor sandstorms could erase them. Thank mm -hmm. you.